Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. I hope you're doing well this Saturday evening. Today, we have a very, very special show that I've just been waiting all week for, and it's entitled Making the Most Out of That One Opportunity. Um, the Sherrard Show is brought to you by eBoat. eBoat is the revolutionary weight loss program. You see it right on your screen. That's going to allow you to lose weight the healthy and all natural way. Um, just enter the keyword Sherrard, and you can get 20% off off your first bottle, or you can also go to www.eboat.com. And then also is brought to you by Life Lessons uh, by Stephanie Angelini. She currently has the number one hit out uh, in Australia called Cause of You. You definitely want to be able to uh, pick up her CD. She's charting, doing big things in the industry. Definitely see it on your monitor. Click on stephanieangelini.com and pick up her CD today. You know, here in the Sherrard Show, oftentimes um, we have big, big celebrities and guests to start off the show and to also talk about their careers and highlight, but few episodes are bigger than today. Today we have two gentlemen have, that have been in the industry for years, um, in the, as, as, as producer, as an engineer, as a percussionist, as an actor, and, and he also, this particular individual, also can, he looks like Richard Pryor and can also do a dead dead impersonation of him and we'll talk about that in a moment mr victor orlando has stopped by the show how are you this evening sir i'm doing great how are you doing i'm, just, yeah, I'm doing absolutely great and i just can't wait to jump into our interview and then we have a living legend ladies and gentlemen this man first pushed the record button in 1958 and he hasn't stopped pushing it ever since he has worked <laughs> awesome Awesome, iconic individuals such as Lionel Richie, Michael Jackson, Natalie Cole, Johnny Mathis, Diana Ross, Gladys Knight, Phil Collins, Kenny Rogers, even Outcast, Mary J, the four tops, on and on and on. And I'm so honored to have him on the show, Mr. Reggie Dozier. How are you, sir? I am blessed, sir. I should ride. I'm blessed, man. It's nice to be on your show, too. I'm honored. I'm honored to have you um, all both on the show. Now, let's start off first with you, Victor. Now, Victor, you are titled the percussionist for the stars. Tell us a little bit about how you got that nickname. Somebody threw that on me. <laughs> I've just been playing for a lot of people for a lot of years, and they they all happen to be everybody. Everybody is a star, so I said. But your shine is just different from the other person's. So the ones that's on level A, I get to play with them. The ones that's on level B, I get to play with them. So it's just, it's more spotlighted when I'm with Billy Preston, Ozone, Gap Band, Shaka Khan, Buddy Miles. It's more highlighted when I'm with those people. So that's how, dang, dude, every time I see you playing with a with an A-list star, you a percussionist okay. to the stars. I'm like, okay, if that's what you want to say, I'll take it. Well, it's, it's been a, such a fascinating career. Uh, now, when did you get your start, Victor, in being a percussionist? Well, I started back in Dallas, Texas, uh, mid-60s in, in school. And then it progressed to California. And I started touring with different groups and going out of, on tours and out of the country and then came back. So around 78-ish is when I hit L.A. and just started Whoever would pick me up, whoever called, I'm there. So around 78, so I'm basically 50 years into the business now. Wow, that is utterly impressive. Now let's slide over to the living legend. Now, Mr. Dozier, first of all, um, starting in 1958, with all of the uh, things that was going on back then, how did you get your start and what inspired you? Well, back then it was... Uh... It was a new thing for everybody as far as the industry was concerned. My brother was a big influence in my life as far as getting me to be involved with music because as you know, he's uh, with, or was with, still with actually Holland Ocean and Holland and they wrote a lot of songs and I just wanted to be, well, actually close to my brother. I never thought about it. But then uh, I had an opportunity to go with him to uh, Anna Records and it was Anna Cordy had her label started and a lot of new guys came coming in from the South, you know, like David Ruffin, uh, Jimmy Ruff. Most of the guys that came into Motown had came up and started. Actually, it was a foothold for everybody to get in the industry and get known because of Anna getting it started. Of course, then Barry came along, but my influence came from that point 
when I started working there and they asked me to do some recording and I liked it and I did a few things and later on uh, finished high school and then I left there and went to service and then got back and seen my brother and it was like really hitting like all over the place. So I said, well, maybe I should go on back into this again. So he told me, he said, I need to, you know, get a little more electronics because my, my background is electronics. So I started doing electronics, uh, Holland Ocean Holland, left Motown, started there in Stuart Studio, uh, HCH Sound Studio, the Victor's Hot Wax. And, that began my total career from that point really out there. But I was had opportunity to be with a lot of the, you know, popular people in the industry. And you're making a wonderful understatement, but very few people can have even a fraction of the success that you have. You know, your resume spans even working with Warner Brothers and 20th Century and United Artists and Universal Pictures. And then even both of you all, Victor, and I'll throw this to you in a moment, you both uh, produced and worked with Bobby Womack as well. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now you're both smiling at the same time because, and I know why you're smiling because he's something to work with, isn't that correct? Yeah, it was to work with. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. Now, now, Victor, I'm going to throw this to you. Um, you said you started in the mid '60s. You don't look like you're that old, but I'll give you, I'll give you that. But you said you started in the mid '60s. Now, what was music like in the '60s uh, when you started? Well, uh, when I say that, um, I say basically 65, I'm in middle school or junior high going to high school. So I'm in the band and I'm playing drums in the high school band. So that's basically the start start. And then listening to the wave of music that was out of Dallas, Texas, which was just phenomenal. And then the rock music came along and then the Latin music came along. And so I'm listening to everybody. And, and, and that's how I started my foundation of playing. That's how I can play with everybody because I listen to everybody. So from A to Z, whoever calls me up, oh, I know exactly, I know your music. I, I've listened to it or I know of the music and I can play it. I don't want to ever get categorized into a percussionist niche. He only plays Latin. He only plays African. He only plays pop. And then I can't get any other gigs. So I try to play it all so when the phone rings, I can get to, to work. But from the time I came up, it was listening to all those kinds of music that foundationed me to keep going and keep playing with just different, you know, different music. And it's fascinating. You all can see some of his music. I will be playing as well momentarily. Um, this man can get down and we're going to talk about his hits in a moment. Now, speaking of hits, we'll, uh, I'm going to toss it to you, Mr. Doja. Now, in 1957, Sam Cooke had his first hit, You Send Me. You started in 1958. And looking at your resume and looking at it again, I see that's one person that's not on the list. Did you ever uh, work or produce anything with Sam Cooke? With Sam Cooke? No, not actually what I did with Sam Cooke. I sold that record you sent me. I worked in a record shop and I used to take that record <laughs> and sell, I sold that record actually, you know, in a record shop in Detroit. But uh, as far as working with him, I never had, I, I always wanted to, just to be around this guy because he had so much talent, he was so good. Everybody says that. Now, um, now Mr. Dozier, one thing that's interesting is that um, Motown, tell everybody what's the birth, what was the year of the birth of Motown? Well, I'd have to say that that had to have been around 59, 60 before it really started to really, people starting to recognize, uh, mainly the artists start to see that Barry was growing on something that looked like it was going to be quite successful. So, of course, everybody that knew how to do WAP or had any kind of thing intention in mind that they could sing, they, they spread it out to him to try to get involved. So it really turned into something big, I guess, around 59, 60, and 61, it started growing, of course, and you had uh, the Supremes that really popped out. And of course, you always had Smokey. And when Smokey merged with Barry, as a hell of a team, they really jumped it off and really got it started and then started pulling everybody in. Ryan Holland, Eddie Holland singing, uh, what's that the weird song he sang? We got this song. Uh, he had a hit record, and that was with Motown. 
And that was actually the beginning of around 59, 60, 61 in that area. Wow, wow. Now let me toss this to you, Victor. Now um, in the music industry, we know how competitive it is, but you're not just a percussionist, you're also an actor, you're also a producer, you, always, you also do a lot of things in the industry. And as I said to my audience, you also do a mean impression of Richard Pryor. But my question is, how were you, how were you able to stay relevant some 40 plus years in the industry? That's, that's God, because um, I'm trying to do everything as close to right as possible. So if he's got a blessing to keep me going the next year, then I'm relevant that year. If he's got me something for the next year, then I'm So I just let him give me stuff and I look up and years go by, but I've done stuff. I can thankfully say I'm not leaning on the what I used to do. You know, the Janet Jackson thing, what have you done lately? Well, I've got lately. So God gave me lately. So I'm not, each time I look up, I got something new. Uh, reinventing myself or somebody somebody's made the statement and I love that you know I haven't seen him in years haven't talked to him in, hey man what you doing I know you're doing something that makes me feel good you know that I wasn't just sitting around waiting you know to collect a check or waiting for a check to collect me I did something and people noticed that you know well, he always doing something go to his page he's doing something this week he's doing something this year he's doing something next month so I thank God for that. I'm, that's what keeps me relevant is him giving me something new, fresh, inventive each week, day, month, year until he's finished with his plan. That's how I look at it. That's very well said. Now, um, what about you, Reggie? What is your perspective on it? Now, being in the industry and relevant for 62 years, a lot of people, most artists can't even be relevant or stay relevant for six years. How is it you were able to stay uh, with such wonderful staying power and work with some of these fantastic people that we've only seen on television or dreamed of working for? Well, I, I think that for me, it started out, instead of being uh, as far as music is concerned, say recording music and things, I have an education as electronics engineer in physics and accounting in business trying to determine if I really wanted to be in the business. But as it turned out by getting my education in electronics, I was asked to build studios. So I started working on studios and people say, well, uh, we got a young guy here that don't know how to operate. You got all this equipment here, they can't operate it. Would you come in and do it? So I said, well, let me get off more into this end of it as opposed to just uh, say, doing uh, the electronics of it, I started doing the mixing. And well, actually they asked me, uh, Eddie Holland them asked me, uh, they sent some uh, information down to me. The, the, the office was downtown and the studio was uh, uh, up Grand River North. So they asked me to do a mix because nobody was there. They need some rough mixes on some songs. So I did it the next day. Somebody came from downtown and said, who did this? And I said, well, I did it. I'm like scared to go, they're gonna fire me. I must have messed it up. <laughs> and then they said, what are you doing upstairs, man? You gotta come down here. So I started, I started engineering. I started doing more stuff then. And then uh, my brother decided to come out here and wanted me to come with him. And ABC called us in to come there. And we went there to do some work with them. And that was the spark. That was when I got into it, really stayed into it. That was now, like- now, so, uh, now, for the audience who had just joined us, we are talking to two iconic figures, a living legend in Reggie Dover, um, who has produced and engineered for Motown and many, many movies. Um, his laundry list of people he's worked with, um, and Michael Jackson, again, Diana Ross, Gladys Knight, Lionel Richie, Johnny Mathis, Aretha Franklin, Phil Collins, Kenny Rogers, the legendary Miles Davis, Outkast, Mary J, The Four Tops, B.B. King, Bobby Blue Bland, James Ingram, the Isley Brothers, Marvin Gaye, even Bobby Womack, just to name a few. And these, and some of the, one of the hits that you had uh, produced, two of them that I absolutely love, Endless Love by uh, Lionel Richie and Diana Ross, as well as uh, Lady by Kenny Rogers. Now tell me um, what was behind the inspiration? I know Lionel Richie wrote that song for Kenny Rogers, but that song, uh, um, Endless Love, that's sang by so many, um, so many um, weddings. It's, uh, that song has been sung, and as well, it was off of a movie. Now what's your inspiration behind that song? 
uh, inspiration in what respect as far as working, doing it? I mean, did you ever uh, believe that he was going to be that big of a monumental hit? Yeah, you know, half the things that I did, I never even thought, thought about it. It was like, you know, I had an opportunity to work with this person. So I was going so fast and doing so much stuff that my whole thing was just, I was just honored to work with some of these people. But then when they started coming back, I say, well, look like I didn't hit a niche here, boy, this stuff is happening, it's like I gotta do. So that, that was the thing that got me really going into it. And the more work I would do and the more things I had, the more people would call me, like the Gene Page, uh, Benjamin Wright, uh, Paul Reiser, all these arrangers would call me to record their stuff. And then everybody would say, hey, that's a rough, that sounds like a mix. So then I started working from that. That's a that's a bad man. And and now let me kick it off to you, Victor. Um, don't 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 um think you're getting off a hook on this question. <laughs> now, now, Victor, um, first of all, you you also were a part of when black um African African American actors were huge in the seventies, um, doing a lot of films, and you did a lot of uh, quite a few blockbuster films in the seventies. Now, did they call what was your nickname? Dynamite, Black Dynamite. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, actually, when I came up here in 78, 79, uh, playing in the different clubs around, uh, they were shooting movies. They were shooting Rudy Ray Moore Dolomite movies. And as they were doing it, the group I was with, Tony Davis, Patty Williams, the group that I played with, were in, uh, they were hooked up with the production people of this. So they became the bands that played in the club scenes in these movies. I think I did three movies with Rudy Ray Moore uh, uh, and I'm in it playing percussion in two of them. And I'm in it playing a dope dealer in one of them too. <laughs> 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 but that, you know, hey, growing up they said, hey, we need somebody to, you know, be a PCP worker in the lab. You know, you're in the band, take this role. I took it. So I think it had one line in it. But uh, I did it. You know, that was the beginning of doing music and getting into the acting and get which I'm not getting into. I was already doing acting in theater in Dallas, Texas. I was an actor in Dallas, per se. Um, I did four theater plays, theatrical plays in school. Uh, I was in the I was the only black in Dallas in the um, uh repertoire theater that had the uh, festival. I was the only black that auditioned and made it. I did 500 Bales of Cotton by Tennessee Williams and uh, Silva Vicario was my character. So that was really big for me to be on that level and that stage of doing the Tennessee Williams play at like 17, 18 years old. Wow. And, but I kept all of that and came, and came to LA. So I've had acting and, and theater and acting and music basically both in me. Now, let me so when I, came out, when I came out here, I, those movies were starting to, I started to be around it so I could be in them. And Black Di uh, uh, Dolomite led to Black Dynamite 40 years later, which was so spiritually ironic that yeah, Michael John White. Yeah, that's a, that's amazing. Um, but you know, there were some great movies back there in the '70s. You know, Cotton Comes to Harlem. Uh, yeah, you had yeah. a Dynamite movie. You had a Superfly. Um, you had a lot of those different movies. It was just an awesome renaissance. Now, let me ask you another question, Victor, um, on that template. Now, with it comes to music, um, you kind of alluded to it a bit, for, uh, uh, Mr. Dozier. But I'm going to ask you now. I want to. I want someone to bring back the doo wop. First of all. Motown killed doo-wop. I loved doo-wop, but <laughs> Motown came, it destroyed it. Now, um, Victor, are you a big fan of uh, doo-wop? I am now. I wasn't in the beginning. I mean, I love harmonies. Now, I really love the harmony groups. You know, uh, I, was, I was a big fan of Three Dog Night and Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young before I was a fan of The Temptations, The Dramatics, and all of the other doo-wop groups. I was a bigger fan of the rock harmony groups before I was of the black harmony groups. I don't know why. I was just in Dallas and I was in a niche and that's what I heard, Three Dog Night. That's what I heard, Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Young. Mm -hmm. Later, the stylistics, the temptations and all of that harmony of all of those groups, I'm like, this is bad. And then I started singing. That's what put me into singing first tenor in church 
from those groups because I couldn't do tenor. And I mean, first, uh, uh, yeah, first tenor, I couldn't do uh, bass. And I didn't know, I didn't know where the notes were going. All I knew was what I heard naturally. And bet you by golly, you wow. Check and out. that's what I heard. That's what I heard. And that's what I stayed. You are the one that I've been waiting for forever. <laughs> hey, hey, you're getting ahead of me. You're getting ahead of me now. <laughs> now, now got Reggie, it. Um, still got it. <laughs> now, now, Reggie, um, in terms of uh, the doo wop, now, are you a big fan of the doo wop? Were you a big fan of Frankie Lyman and the uh, teenagers and um, the silhouettes and all them? Hey, man, I was on the corner, man, 10 o'clock at night, doo wopping with my brother. <laughs> <laughs> The Romeos, my brother had a group called the Romeos, mm -hmm. and I used to try to sing with them. But see, my voice was what happened was it was crazy why I didn't get off into the singing because I had a high voice. They always wanted me to say the high parts, you know, like, <laughs> a, a, you, hey man, you got a voice like Smokey, man. You need to, sing. I'm like, man, I don't sing like no girl. And that was <laughs> the only, that's the only thing that took me out. But I started saying, I was singing in church. And I sung this song called Grace. And I was hiding the girls, man. But I said, no, wait a minute. I can't do this no more. So I, I didn't do it anymore. But that was my, my thing, was singing high. You know, that's, really, that's, that's funny you say that because, um, you know, um, Eddie Holman sung, sung very high. Very right. High. You know, right. and the stylistics, as you were saying, Vic, they sung very high. And they had so many hits. It, they didn't put out a bad song. With the right, right. It just, it just wasn't me, man. I was like, hey, man, I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I see. But my question to you now, and I'm gonna, this is for both of you all. Um, I'll start with you, Reggie. Now, um, with the young people today, now you've you've produced Outcast, you've done their um speaker box album, and um, quite a few others, like um, quite a few younger people as well in this younger generation. Now, in a comparison to like the Outkast and the Mary J. Blige, opposed to the, the, the Diana Rosses and the Michael Jacksons and people of yesteryear, do you see a difference in where music is going today opposed to when you started in 1958? Yeah, I, I'm, often, I'm asked that question a lot. I hate to say it, but I could never get off into rap Rap to me was Aid Bar Luke. I'm into structure of music. I learned music, you know, back in the day where everything that came out had structure to it. And it had meaning and meaning instead of just a, a feeling. Let's say like a rapper would take eight bars and loop it and then he put his lyrics over. Then he say he has a song, but it's not really sung, it's rapped. So to me, I'm old school. But not knocking anybody, somebody say, hey, can you mix this song for me? I'll cast. Oh, no problem, man. Here I am. I do whatever is necessary to do. If they want me to do it, I'll do it. So I have no opinion anymore. It's like, you got the money? I'm ready. <laughs> now, what about, you? what about you, Victor? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I kind of hate that there is no more good music coming out fresh and new everything like mr doja said we grew up on certain kind of music and it's like that much of that music has ended now you got manufactured music and that's fine for the generation and the genre that it is but i wish we could we had some people coming up singing and playing that kind of music that we used to listen to and not just manufacturing it uh a couple you know i go in the studio with rappers sometime and all they want is eight bars of kungas and then that's it. And then they're going to piece it and put it together and string it out where they want it. You know, whereas opposed to back in the day, I was in the studio for hours on one song with the kungas and, and everything else that went with it. But it's okay if that's what they want to do. There's a crowd for that. There's a niche for that. But right. um, I just don't appreciate listening to it because there's nothing to appreciate. You know, music is supposed to be appreciated. Well, we don't we don't have anything to appreciate. They appreciate it because they made it. They're the new millennial generation that listens to it. And it's, you know, fine. it's like it's a piece of pie. Everybody's got their own slice. 
But unfortunately, right now, their slice is a little bigger than ours. You know, it's one interesting you say that, Victor, because um, the rap has been around longer than any genre of music. Rap started in the 80s and it's still going strong now when you terms of um, hip hop, starting off with Kumo D, uh, Ghetto Boys, and um, going way back then. But, you know, it's uh, it's interesting point you're mentioning because the music such as Smokey Robinson, The Temptations, um, you know, Diana Ross, so on and so forth, that has been sampled almost a thousand, I have a, I have a, I have a stat here. 5,000 times has the music from yesteryear been sampled on music um, currently today. I had the Isley Brothers on the show and they told me that, that Who's That Lady has been sampled 800 times by artists of today. And a lot of them don't even know who sang it. They just heard something they liked and they turn around and just um, put that in their, um, in their rap. But I'm, I, I like the music that talks to the women instead of talking about them. That's the women. That's the music. I yeah, like, I like that. Point. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that music when you can't find the words to say what to say to her. So you just put the LP on and let it play, and she understands. Let it play, and that'll help you out. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> thanks to you, and thanks to you, Victor. You all have helped populate the earth. You know that with your music. With your music, you helped populate the earth. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Victor, I'm going to say something to you. Um, let's do a station identification again. We are speaking to uh, the legendary Reggie Dozier. Um, uh, phenomenal super producer has been around since 1958, produced some of the biggest acts in the world today, as well as Victor Orlando, who is the percussionist for the stars. Um, this is not Richard Pryor in the show. This is a gentleman who's been around for many years, and he does an awesome impressionation of him. You'll hear that in a moment. Now, um, Victor, what I, I hear you have a wonderful album out uh, that's coming out. You have great music out now, but you have a wonderful album. And before we talk about the album, some of your biggest hits has come from the Latin side. Now, what was the inspiration behind that? Well, the whole thing came from I used to be a drummer. I was a drummer because I played drums in the band. And when football season was over, it's time for jazz band season in the band room. So everything changes. There's no more marching on the field now. Everybody's sitting down learning, but I'm but I'm but I'm but I'm but I'm but I'm but they're learning jazz stuff. Well, there's a line of drummers ready to play in a jazz band. And the band director got to me and was like, I have no more chairs and drummer. He said, There's some kungas over there if you want to play those. I said, Okay. I started mm -hmm. playing the kungas. And I'm like, okay, I don't have no competition from anybody. I'm cool with this. And then Woodstock came out and I saw Santana and that was it for me. <laughs> I never played drums anymore. Santana and, and the, the Kungas were up front, right next to Carlos. They weren't in the back. They weren't over in the corner. They were right on the front line. I'm like, oh, snap, that's cool. And then, of course, <laughs> Sheila E and Tito Puente and all of those people came and their stuff was up front. I'm like, that's what I want to be. I want to be the upfront dude with my stuff up front and I'm going to take it from there. <laughs> but being, being part Puerto Rican also kind of, I didn't know I had the influence in me because of my heritage thing. You know, um, I'm, from what I'm getting from home, dad was part Puerto Rican. I was part Puerto Rican, Victor Orlando. I have a black name also, but Victor Orlando is, is in me. And then the percussion came naturally and then I was like, okay, I don't want to hear no other music. Let me hear Santana, 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 Santana. And then that's how I started thinking, writing, and playing until other groups came along and, and, and balanced it off that I was doing some of everybody. But that's, I love Latin music. It moves people more than pretty much any music on the planet. Rock has its way of making people crazy. Funk and Latin, funk makes its way of making people soulful. But Latin, put a Latin record on, Three seconds after song, somebody's dancing somewhere. So, so you said, Victor, if you don't have any rhythm, when you listen to some Latino music, you gonna find some rhythm, huh? Somewhere, huh? Oh yeah, yeah. That everybody has rhythm, everybody, because everybody got a heartbeat. You got rhythm. There you go. There you go. Now, um, Reggie, for you, now you could have retired after Endless Love. You could have retired when after working with Bobby Womack. You could have retired long, long time ago, but you did not. Now tell me, Reggie, why are what's keeping you in the game some 62 years? The love of music. 
I love music and just uh, the creativity of it. It's being able to come up with something different. Uh, it's a challenge now because there's so much software out there now. Uh, it's hard to maintain it because it, everything is changing and revolving so much. But because of that, I can't retire because it's, it just overwhelms me to see what they're doing with music. <laughs> it just keeps me going, it keeps me going. Then people call me and say, hey, would you do my record for me? I said, well, so and so and so, so maybe half of them. Then they pay the whole damn thing. I go like, okay, I'll do it then. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'll say this, I'll say this, um, uh, um, Victor and uh, Reggie, I need you to help me out on something. I need you to help me to bring back the doo -wop. I wasn't born on the time when they were doing it on the corners and stuff, but serenading the ladies. But that is one genre I want to see come back because that was some great music, great harmonizing, and they didn't use instruments. So can we get on a mission to bring that back like the Blues Brothers? I would Sounds love good. To. Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> now, now, no. uh, now in, I'm going to throw something to you. Again. We're going to, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have the world premiere of Victor Orlando doing the impersonation of Richie Pryor in a moment. <laughs> but um, yeah. Reggie, now for artists, say for example, I have an artist that says, I saw your episode, I would love to have um, Reggie uh, to be in front of, get my information in front of him. Or do you do that? Do you in turn um, um, represent artists or do you help them along the way with their careers? Yeah, I do in, in some, well, actually pretty much everything that I do as far as uh, the engineering, I started a course at California College of Music and Engineering in Pasadena set up their curriculum for that. But then uh, over the years, I've always tried to help the younger guy behind me because I know that at some point in their lives, they're gonna go ahead and go past what I'm doing and do something more than what I'm doing. So I love the, the fact that I can give back something that I learned because I learned when there was no school as far as the music is concerned, I had to learn it uh, verbatim as it came along. You know, like most of the guys that I worked with over the years, they helped me, you know, to be able to create. Everyone had a different way of working, a different way of doing it. Therefore, I learned from them. So because I'm a God-fearing person and I feel that mm -hmm. I should give something back, I try and give it to the younger people so they can see how things could be done. That's wonderful. Now, um, two more questions and I'm gonna let you all both out of here. And now, um, Reggie, what advice would you give to someone? Because you were presented 62 years ago with an opportunity that you made the most out of. You made the most out of it and turn it to diamond, platinum, 10 times over, et cetera. What kind of advice would you give to individuals who these days, many times, they don't take advantage of that one opportunity? The, the advice I would give them is don't stop. It's keep going. I had a person, I can mention his name. He passed away a few years back. Uh, it's a guy named Barney Perkins. Victor, remember him. He's, he's a hell of an engineer. And, and he was a little in front of me as far as studio work. And Barney was good. He did a lot of nice things. So I learned from him. But at some points, I used to say, I can't get it past this guy. Everybody wants Barney. But then things started happening for me and people started calling me after I do a few things and say, hey, this guy's pretty good. And then after I hit a niche, I started going. So don't stop. Don't, don't let nothing stop you from going in life because life goes on if you want to stay here. I'm going for 144 myself and I hope to have my counsel in front of me like I have it right now. That's all you right. Know? That's all right. And what about you, Victor? What kind of advice would you give um, for the youth who many times just can't make or don't make the most out of that one opportunity? Whether it's in football, basketball, whatever, they don't make the most out of that one opportunity. Get out. Get out now <laughs> while you can. <laughs> you out, man. No. You still out. <laughs> <laughs> it will suck you in for the next 60 years get out no if you, if you if you don't have the passion get out because the passion will take you the whole length of the way that's what's going to be your foundation the rest of the way is the passion for whatever it is you're doing but if you don't really have it 
if you're going to hop in and hop out, job here and job there, family here, family there, and wife here and wife, is all this stuff is pulling you and have you so confused. Have the passion. You can have all those things, but have the passion that you're going to keep going, like Reggie said, no matter what. And what I tell the young people when they ask, because I do get that same question, I say, while you vertical, don't go horizontal and leave this earth without leaving some product. Whatever you do, whatever you, if you're an actor, leave one show that you did for somebody to go back and see. For, for me, if I died right now, I would have made it for me. I got an album out. I can leave that album on the shelf for the rest of my life, the rest of eternity, an album will be left. When people leave and they don't leave anything, so does your memory of that person. It's like, oh, oh I remember them. Oh, okay. And that's about as far as it goes. Oh, I remember. I think I got his album. That's what you kind of want. You want them to remember something you left. But don't leave without leaving something. Go in the studio, make an album, make a CD, make a cassette, make something, do something with the creativity God gave you. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you if you're playing football in school as a kid, and you like it, and you, you, you know, I got a son, 6'4", 240. He didn't want to do football. He wanted to be a, a, a blacksmith. Well, leave a sword behind before you leave. Make a sword out of some steel. Do something, but just don't leave this earth without leaving something of your passion that you're passionate about before going. I That's agree. what I tell you. Very good, very good. Well, gentlemen, we're just about out of time. Um, really quick, uh, Mr. Dozier, um, what is the best, um, your social media information where we can be able to contact you or people can ask questions aside from what I'm receiving right now. What uh, I missed part of the word, what do you say? Your social media, best? your social media where anyone can be able to uh, become a fan or get to know Mr. Dozier. Oh, uh, studio, we call it my uh, email is studiomixdoctor at yahoo.com. You can always reach me there or I have a, a, a Gmail account which will get you into Dozier Music and Engineering. So and then I'm also I'm on Facebook and various things that you can get to. Heroes and Legends show. I do that show every year, which is a Motown show. Very I've done good. that for 32 years. So you can call me there too. Very good. And so and the handles will be on your screen for all those who are watching. Also, um, Victor, what is your um go ahead and give us your uh your face, your social media information so we can be able to make sure <laughs> everybody can reach you. Okay, no, I'm on uh Instagram. Victor Orlando 7. I have my YouTube channel, Victor Orlando 1. And I'm on, you can Google me and then you can go to Facebook. It's things I'm at. Very good. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here's the world premiere of uh, Mr. Victor Orlando doing his twin impersonation of Richard Pryor. Take it away, Victor. We are gathered here today on the Sherrod Mitchell show, I think that's the boy name. We had a good time. We was hanging out with the Reg Reggie Dozier person, the Kenton of Holland Dozier, Holland people, you know, from the Motown thing, see? I used to work on that Motown. I was up on the 11th floor in Motown till they kicked me down. I said, boy, you can't deal with no more. You're disturbing everybody. Everybody laughing all day. Can't nobody get no work. Then one day, Mr. Gordy saw me and he said, boy, you sound like Richard Pryor. I said, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I said, can you do a movie on me? You're going to have to put the money up because I ain't got no money. <laughs> so he said, well, you're going to have to stay broke and you ain't going to have no movie because I ain't put no money up. So that's what we left it. So we don't know what we're going to do with it. But I am here to say thank you very much. And I'm going to leave now. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much gentlemen thank you so much for being a part of show. Uh, Reggie we thank you so much I hope you all can be able to come on in a very soon in a very future episode of the show if that's okay with you we need to continue our conversation is that okay it's okay, it's okay. I love it. great show man. great really show great. what you're doing Thank you so much, gentlemen. And Sherard, uh, this is Sherard. Uh, on our next episode of the Sherard Show, we do have, we're going to keep the party rolling. We do have Wendy Farrell that's going to be on the show. Ray Liotta is going to stop by the show. And then also we have Mr. Zorro. He is also a celebrity band member as well as a drummer for many years. I'm Sherard. Check us out on Comcast NBC as well as iHeartRadio and then also on Facebook Live. If, and, if, and my last thing I want to tell you all is that if you're not living a life 
where you're helping others. What are you living for? I'm Sherard. See you next time. Bye-bye now. Take care. Bye-bye, gentlemen.